Thank you for joining me for part three of this Life Academy series, Holy is His Name. We are learning more about God by studying His attributes and names. And last episode, we examined the story of Moses' encounter with God through the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. We learned a lot about who God is through that encounter by studying what God said about Himself in that conversation with Moses. God revealed to us several of his attributes, ways he interacts with his people. That story ended with Moses concerned that when he went back to the Israelite people to tell them that God had a plan to rescue them out of the land of Egypt, they would ask him God's name. God answered Moses saying, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So. Today, we will look at names God has given himself as a way of telling us about his character. God names himself, I am. This name is known as Jehovah or Yahweh, and we usually see it in English Bibles as the word Lord in all capital letters. Now, this can be confusing to us English speakers because the word Lord is used in ways that has nothing to do with God. For example, he's Lord of the manor. Another thing that's confusing is that we use the word God as Jehovah's name. When we pray, we say, dear God, as if we're speaking to someone named God. In Hebrew, it doesn't work like that. The word for God is Elohim. If we wanted to say, our God is I am in Hebrew, we would say our Elohim is Jehovah. Or we could think of it as our God is Jehovah. So when God says to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This would really be, say to the Israelites, Jehovah, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, the Elohim of Jacob has sent me to you. Jehovah is a God whose name means I am. Now the Hebrew word, Jehovah is related to being and to living. God reveals himself here as a living God. In the Hebrew, there's also a connection with the phrase God uses with Moses when he says, I will be with you. There's a relationship there. The words used in this phrase have the same origin as I am. It's possible to translate the name Jehovah as I am who I am. So could this mean God is saying, you will know me by my deeds? You will know me by my works. When I redeem, you will know me as redeemer. When I rescue, heal, provide, you'll know me by these actions. Through the name Jehovah, God is telling us, if you want to know who I am, look at what I do. There are many names for God that are compound names, which start with Jehovah followed by a verb. So let's look at one. Jehovah Jireh. As an example, this is a name for God we find in Genesis 22 at the, at the conclusion of the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. Abraham is about to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice at God's command. At the last moment, the angel of the Lord intervenes and God provides a ram to be sacrificed instead. And as Isaac and Abraham prepared for the sacrifice, Isaac says to his father, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said to Isaac, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. The word provide is jire. Verse 14 finishes the story saying, So Abraham called that place Jehovah Jire, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord, or Jehovah, it will be provided. Jehovah Jire is a powerful name that we could spend a long time unpacking and discussing. But let me simply point out that this name is in a future tense. The Lord will provide. This story of the sacrifice of Isaac, it's preparing us to understand the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. And this simple compound name, Jehovah Jireh, tells the entire gospel story. The name not only tells us that the Lord will provide the sacrifice for our sin, but the Lamb of God, Jesus, the I am himself will be the sacrifice. There are many compound names that begin with Jehovah. This is who I am followed by a verb that gives us new knowledge about God through his actions. In this case, 
one who will provide. But here are some other examples from Exodus 15, Jehovah Rophe, I am who heals you. From Psalm 23, Jehovah Roi, I am the shepherd. There are many more compound names which not only reveal to us more about the character of God, but also point to and help us learn about Jesus, God the Son. Jesus himself claimed this I am name followed by an attribute as a way of naming himself several times. In John 3.35, he said, I am the bread of life. John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Let's examine a couple of names for God the Son and let's start with Jesus. The name Jesus, as we see it in our English Bibles, has only a slight resemblance to the name Jesus was called, which was actually Yeshua. Closer to Joshua in English, we first see this name in Matthew 121, when the angel of the Lord is revealing to Joseph all that is happening to Mary. After assuring Joseph it's okay to marry and to take Mary as his wife, the angel says this, she will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus or Yeshua because he will save people from their sins. The Hebrew origin of the name Yeshua refers to one who saves or one who delivers. Once again, God gives himself a name that reveals part of the nature of who he is. But it's not just the nature of Jesus to rescue or deliver. Remember, we learned in the story of Moses and the burning bush that God also, whose name is Jehovah, has a plan to rescue and to deliver his chosen people out of slavery. This is important. What we learn about one part of the Trinity through names and attributes, we will find true in all parts of the Trinity. Another name for Jesus is revealed to us by John the Baptist in the first chapter of John. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lamb of God is a rich name, full of meaning. God assured Moses that he had a plan to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, and part of that plan required the blood of a spotless lamb to be spread on the doorposts of the Israelite homes. The angel of death would pass over those homes, and ultimately the Israelites were rescued, delivered from slavery. This deliverance is remembered every year at the Passover celebration. But the Passover story was simply preparing us to understand the great sacrifice Jesus would offer as Lamb of God. By using his name, this name, Lamb of God, John the Baptist not only identifies Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice, but John says it's a sacrifice God makes for us, the Lamb of God, and for the whole world. But why is a sacrifice needed to atone for sin? We sacrifice for what we love. We're willing to sacrifice time, money, or anything important to us to demonstrate our love for another. If we didn't give something of ourselves to someone else, how could we demonstrate our love for that person? Romans 5.8 makes it clear. It tells us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gave something of himself for us when Jesus, the Lamb of God, died for us. When John calls Jesus the Lamb of God, he's testifying to the greatest attribute of God, his love. We also know God the Son as Emmanuel. In the book of Matthew, as soon as the story of the angel instructing Joseph to name Mary's son Jesus ends, Matthew says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew is reminding his readers of the prophecy in Isaiah 7:14. Jesus, the deliverer, is also Emmanuel, God with us. Once again, we're taken back to God's revelation of himself to Moses at the burning bush. God promised Moses, I will be with you when Moses knew he was not up to the task God had given him to do. We hear Jesus speak these same words in the very last verse of the book of Matthew. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey 
everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. God with us. Jesus with us. As you learn the names and attributes of God, this is a significant theme. And it's a theme that continues with names for the Holy Spirit. The word most often used for God's Spirit in Hebrew is rauch, which can be translated as breath or spirit. In the creation story, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The breath, the rauch of God, is life-giving. The rauch word appears in Ezekiel 9 also, when God showed Ezekiel a vast graveyard of dry bones that assembled themselves into bodies. Ezekiel writes, I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared in them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign says. Come, breath, come from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. The Spirit, as the breath of life, is found several times in Job. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. The Spirit, as our breath, is a very powerful image. There can be no more intimate and life-sustaining relationship we can imagine than for the breath of God to be our very breath of life, to be the breath that keeps us alive. Well, that gives us an indication of the kind of relationship God wants with us. Think how quickly we panic if we cannot breathe. Paul, writing to the Romans, gives a different look at the breath of the Spirit when he writes, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Paul tells us that it is the Spirit who gives us new life. Being aware of the Spirit as the breath of life is vital, because if we know that the Holy Spirit was able to turn lifeless clay into a living soul, so only the Holy Spirit is able to transform a repentant, believing sinner into a Christian who possesses spiritual life. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of creation and renewal. The Spirit was present at creation, but the Spirit is also present in the recreation of humans. When Nicodemus asked, how can one be born again? In other words, recreated, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. The work of Christ has redeemed us, but it is the Spirit of creation within us that gives us new life. Or as Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. At this point, We've heard how God the Father was with Moses, how Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us as a human. And we know the breath of life, whether it is our human life or our spiritual rebirth, is the Spirit with us. God with us is one of the most significant themes in the Bible, so much so that the names for every member of the Trinity speak to this truth. When we understand one aspect of God, we are learning about the whole of God. Now, there's only been time to touch on just a few of the names we use for God, but I hope you've seen how rich in meaning these names are and how much God wants us to know him about him through his name. In our last episode of Holy is His Name, we will see how knowing God through his names can enrich our worship, our prayer, and our devotional life. I invite you to join me.